Yes. Oh, we're rolling. Okay, good. Uh, yes, so the advertisement for this talk said a friendly introduction to lambda calculus. And I'm not sure how friendly this actually is. So that's sort of strike number one. It also advertised me as a homotopy theorist. Now you might wonder what on earth homotopy theory has got to do with the lambda calculus. If you want to know the answer to that, you'll have to participate in the homotopy type theory reading group, which you can ask me about later. Um, the, third <coughs> thing, the third thing is that um, I'm not sure how long this is going to take, and I know we generally for long talks here we <coughs> take breaks. Um, so I guess when people get tired, they should interrupt, and I'll tell you how much time I think I have left. Um, I know there's enough stuff here, so that's all I want to do tonight. Okay, so um, first we're going to talk a bit about mathematical logic in general, okay? And we're going to go back to um, the roaring 1800s. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah. No. If you do, just say his name. Compton? Hmm? Is it Compton? No. Frege? Frege, yes. Frege. Uh, does anybody know who this is? His brother. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> From another mother. So this is, this is Cantor, okay? George Cantor. And what about this handsome devil here? <laughs> Come on, this is, this is again. Yeah. Two E's. Bertrand Russell, yes, thank you. Um, so I cherry picked a few of the founders of modern logic. Um, and I probably didn't get your favorite logician, for which I deeply apologize. Do <laughs> um, so you have a recap of what's going on? Uh, Frege puts forth an axiomization of mathematics based in logic. Um, <coughs> somewhat novel at the time. Um, of course, Russell disappoints Frege in a, uh, in a uh, handwritten letter to him, pointing out what we, uh, what we now know as, the Rus as Russell's paradox, which deals with the, what, the barber in the small Italian town who shaves everybody who doesn't shave himself. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Cantor, uh, the pioneer of the study of the infinite and the, and the pioneer of, 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 uh, of, of set theory in general. Um, and the, the, the subject matter of set theory that is. Okay, so what we have are um, our early steps at, at um, formalizing mathematics and putting it on a so-called sound basis. Um, but for us, we're interested in this thing that Hilbert formulated, which I can't pronounce. <laughs> it's unpronounceable. It's unpronounceable. Yes. It's unpronounceable. <laughs> There's Hilbert right now, probably thinking about this problem, which I can't pronounce. That is tablet. He's got his tablet. <laughs> this is actually an early Apple product. Think different. Uh, so, what it means, roughly speaking, you have a mathematical statement. Is there an algorithm to compute a proof or refutation of that statement? Okay, it wasn't exactly stated that way, but that's sort of the thrust of it. Okay, and wouldn't that be great? Because then mathematicians would be obsolete. Um, now, I, I just I left academia, so now I no longer feel any sort of protectiveness about the profession. So, obsolete them all. Uh, <laughs> So um, what's interesting right now is actually there's no formalization of the notion of algorithm, okay? So people are talking about effectiveness, algorithms, but nobody really knows what they mean by that, okay? I mean, they have some intuition, right? We all have an intuition of what it means to have an effective procedure or like some mechanical method of doing something, okay? But, but there's, no, there's, there's no formalization. Um, and actually, if you ask some, there still isn't. We have a formalization of computability, but not necessarily a notion of algorithm. We, have, we, have, we now have a formalization of what a computable function is, but we don't really have a formalization of what an algorithm is. Okay. Take your favorite algorithms textbooks and see, see look, look for definitions and see what you get. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so we're going to fast forward a bit and skipping lots of nice history and, and lots of development to sort of zero in on, on uh, the subject matter at hand. Um, Schoenfinkel, uh, the unsung hero of combinatory logic. Um, doesn't like bound variables. Um, if that doesn't mean anything to you right now, then don't worry about it. But he defines something because of his hatred of the bound variables. He, defi he defines something called the combinatory logic, um, and that essentially defined a, um, a system of combinators that's equivalent to the SKI system, which I'll actually define later in the talk if you, are, if you don't know what that is yet. But it's some formal system for, um, for logic based on this notion of combinator <coughs> function. And basically all you can do is apply them to each other or form them or form terms involving them. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll define that in terms of the lambda calculus, because that's what this talks about. Now, um, Haskell Curry also did this roughly contemporaneously and independently um, to tackle this beast called substitution, which was sort of a, I don't know, a loose end 
for instance, in Britain, Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica. Um, and it continues to sort of be, whenever you, whenever you read a mathematical logic text, and somebody describes substitution, they sort of, there's a little bit of, there's always a little bit of hand waving, okay? Really, substitution, all it means is what you do in grade school, where um, if f of x is equal to x plus 3, um, and you want to apply that to something, this is also beta reduction, but I'm getting ahead of myself, <laughs> then you say, well, let me, let me use the number 2. Do we need more light on this board? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't have enough light. There's not enough light. Okay, I'm not going to use the board that much. But <laughs> basically, substitution means um, when I substitute 2 for x, I mean it to replace every instance of x with the number 2, like that. And then I can go ahead and evaluate that, that expression. Okay. So you all, the point is, you all know what substitution means. Okay? Uh, you all know what it means. Formalizing it is, is, um, is tricky, to put it in, in purely formalistic terms. And this is sort of the, a bugaboo around this time in the uh, in late 20s. Um, interestingly enough, speaking of Haskell Curry and uh, Schoenfinkel, Schoenfinkel actually came up with Curry. <laughs> uh, there you have it. So, in fact, Schoenfinkel apparently originally came up with this notion that if, you, if I have a function of two variables, I can replace that with a function of one variable valued in functions. <coughs> and do that, something we, you know, something we're quite used to, right? So I guess you should call it Schoenfinkeling, but it's a bit long and curing sounds better. <laughs> Oh well. All right. The star of the show, Alonzo Church. Um, roughly, sort of contemporaneous with all these developments, wants a new formal system for logic based upon the notion of function application. So, what was around up to this point? Well, you had Russell Whitehead, which I'm not even going to try to, to describe, um, <laughs> which nobody ever reads at this point. But basically, uh, we're, we're essentially an attempt to uh, to fix Russell's paradox by introducing a, a system of types. And then, of course, our good old friend, Zermelo Frankel, set theory. Okay. So we really have logic based around some notion of membership or set of class okay, up to this point. And Haskell Curry says, well, if you ask me, functions are more natural as primitive things to think about. Okay. So let's, let's make a formal system that only deals with functions. Okay. How do we do that? Um, so this formal system is going to be called the lambda calculus. And um, here's our first lambda expression. It's, it's the identity function. Ready? Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So I'm going to go on to define formally the language, but this is the function that takes something and gives you it back, right? So this is the argument, and this is the result. If you want to think about that, think about it that way. Okay. So syntactically, you're separated by dot. Huh? Syntactically, you're separated by dot. Syntactically, you're separated. Yeah, I use a dot here. Um. So there. Oh yeah. There's a host. Let me. a Russell dot. What? A what? It's an old Russell dot. Well, before they had parentheses, White and Russell used dots. Ah. Before parentheses were invented. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Russell was a really smart guy. All right. Uh, actually, we all know parentheses didn't exist until this All right. All right. So, uh, <laughs> really. Okay. So, uh, there's the identity function, and I use a dot. Oh, yeah. And of course, with any, with any subject in mathematical logic, there's various ways of formalizing it in various syntaxes. I'm just going to stick to one. If it's not your favorite, then you can yell at me later. Um, why use lambda for function abstraction? Um, there's a cute story, which um, I originally got from Ray, and then verified with, with another source. Not that I don't trust Ray. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but apparently, because there's another twist to the story, actually. So, um, Whitehead and Russell used x hat for class abstraction. Okay, well, if you move this hat off of the x, you get something that looks like that. And then apparently, lambda x was somehow easier to print than that. Okay. <laughs> and this is why, to this day, wow. you write lambda. Okay. You write it in Python, you write it in all sorts of languages, okay? Or in, in Haskell, you use a little slash. Oh, the other thing is also lambda, but a capital one. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah well. Yeah, Actually, the, typically a math a math typeset wedge is, is distinct from a capital lambda, but I but I like your I like your line of thought. Uh, so um, actually, so Church Church told this story at one point, and then later in life he claimed that he just needed a symbol and he just happened to use lambda. So who knows? Okay, that's the uh, that's the twist. So it's, it's rather ambiguous actually. I like this story better, so we'll stick with that. Um, okay, so in a formal system. We have to give clear rules about the sort of statements you can, what you can write down, and how you can transform what you just wrote down into something else. Okay, basically. 
Um, they'd be very specific about what you can and cannot do. And note that this is all, people are doing this in the age before you, you had, um, before you had compilers and things to check whether or not you did something correctly, okay, or things to run these things on. Um, and actually, I was thinking about writing a Lambda evaluator to make this talk, but I decided that, well, you know, Church didn't have such a thing, so I'm just going to do it all by hand. Except that Church also didn't have copy and paste, but okay. Um, so, you know, I, okay. Anyway, it's kind of like designing a programming language. Um, here we go. Woo! Um, first, we have to fix an alphabet of variables. Typically, you don't need more than x and y, so just pick some letters. <laughs> Except, we'll need more than x and y, but for some of the meteor stuff we're going to But typically, for explaining, you can explain a lot of things with two variables. It's really wonderful. Uh, okay, here's the, here's the rules for uh, lambda term formation. So these rules explain what you can write down, and then so that you know that what you just wrote down is some uh, state or some uh, expression in the language, or some term in the language. If x is a variable, then x is a valid lambda term. Okay, so you can write down variables. If t is a valid lambda term, so this is the recursive or inductive uh, definition, okay, those of you who have played with grammars, um, it should be this, this entire room, right? <laughs> yeah, this is just NYC. I should be like, passing through this. All right, so if t is a valid lambda term and x is a variable, then um, lambda x dot t is a valid lambda term. Now, I'm going to be a bit loose whether I surround this with parentheses, and, and I will do it when, it's, when I need to, roughly speaking. Okay, I'm going to be a bit loose about the surrounding parentheses. Okay, the fundamental thing is the uh, lambda x dot t there. Okay, um, and this is called lambda abstraction. Now, if t and s are valid lambda terms, then I can apply t to s. Again, this is Lisp NYC. This should look really, really comfortable, right? I'm actually confused by the dot notation. So does <laughs> lambda x dot t, the t it means what? The t is the body? Yes, the t is the, yeah, exactly. The t, oh. t is the body of the function. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. x is the variable, t is some expression that we can put some variables, or, you know, substitute some substitution with. Uh, okay. substitution to make this into this, we'll put a parenthesis around the x and give it the dot. Yeah. All right. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I should also admit that I haven't actually coded this in like 10 years, until I made this talk, so. Uh, but I tried to keep it somewhat close to the syntax. Um, Okay, let's construct some stuff. Uh, here's a variable. Okay, I wrote that down. Okay, I took this variable and actually made a lambda abstraction over itself. Um, great. Here's another variable. I can apply that variable to itself, whatever that means. All right. I mean, it's valid in the language. Mm -hmm. Interesting side note, Church. Hopefully I made this right. <laughs> Church wasn't really so focused on all the things you could write down in his language having a meaning. In the same sense, so it was more analogous. Like you, with the English language, you can make a host of meaningless statements, but you can also make meaningful statements. So, in fact, Church wasn't so um, concerned with, 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 with um, semantics, really. Okay. Okay. Now that I've got this, um, I can apply this to this because I've got both of them. So I can apply the, I can apply that to that. Okay. I can make that thing. And now that I've got this thing, I can do another lambda abstraction over y. Fine. So we can make all sorts of things now, right? within the rules. Um, and I've, now those, those, those notations have intuitions behind them. Okay, function abstraction is what we usually think of. Yes? Can you go back to the last slide yes. for one sec? Did I make it? Oh, um, I don't guarantee that all my parentheses are balanced. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I know how seriously this community takes its parentheses, so I, I deeply apologize. We give you a few as a bonus. You can <laughs> Thank you, yes. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe like plus or minus like right. five parentheses for the right. top. Right, there you go. 3 dB. Good, okay. So at this point, these are just typographical rules. This is, these are just, yeah, these are just rules for writing things down that are valid. I'm just giving you some rules. Whether or not they mean anything. Whether or not they mean anything. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of scribblings on paper. Until I give you rules for manipulating them. Um, which is sort of the proof theoretic perspective on what meaning is, in a sense. Um, proof theorists like to write formal systems down and then have rules for emulating one to another. Model theorists like to take the formal systems and map them to some set of something or some mathematical object and give them meaning. Okay. Um, but we're going to stick to this perspective because that's where that was developed. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And these rules will be called generally the reduction rules of the language. So we have formation rules and we have reduction rules. Sense. That's, that's what's going to uh, comprise our language. 
um, which is quite different from, for instance, Tarski's definition of truth that I mentioned, Tarski for J, and uh, or or something like any mean from something like denotational semantics. Um, in fact, denotational semantics turned out to be a difficult problem for the lambda calculus, and I may or may not talk about that later. So, here are the rules. There are three of them, kind of symmetric to the three formation rules. Not really symmetric, but at least the same number of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is symmetry anyway? Cardinality, right? Uh, some of them. All right. So alpha equivalent says I can rename and I'm going to form. I'm going to just give you the. My goal is to give you the gist of these, and then sort of formally define them. Although you see that they're not really, really, really formally defined, but hopefully enough. Um, alpha equivalent renaming variables. You can rename variables and functions and see how that works. You already know how that works. Um, Beta reduction. We have to define what application means. Okay. How does application? How does function application work? And eta conversion, which basically says that two functions are the same if they do the same thing to their arguments. I put the same in quotes. Sameness is uh, also a uh, an elephant in the room here, which we'll gradually talk more about. But let's stick with this one. Actually, you already know all these rules sort of intuitively. You really are. You really already know these rules intuitively. So excuse me. Yes. When you say do the same thing, yes. does that mean they have the same uh, output or value? Precisely. Given the, yeah, yeah, I'm going to talk about that in a bit. <coughs> Given the same inputs, they produce the same outputs. Okay. Yep. Um, alpha equivalence lets, lets, lets us do this, for instance. We say that lambda x dot x is the same as lambda y dot y. They're both the identity function. Okay. I just put <coughs> variables. For example. Um, Generally, alpha equivalents let, lets us rename any bound variable. So what is a bound variable? It's something that um, gets bound by a lambda. Okay, that was recursive definition. But it's something that's sort of acting like a, a parameter. Okay, it's a variable that, yeah, it's been captured by some lambda. Okay, so in fact, this variable is bound by this, if you like. Can you say with free variables that would necessarily be true? Uh, we'll talk about free variables when we talk about beta reduction. But alpha equivalence deals with, I have a lambda abstraction, and I can convert, um, I can read in bound variables. Uh, OK, we think about this a lot as programmers. This is a fictitious language in which I miss a semicolon. But it doesn't matter because the language is fictitious, so it's fine. <laughs> uh, here I've got some global variable x, and I've got a function that takes two parameters, x and y, and returns x1. Of course, we all look at this and say, well, you know, this ought to print the number 7, really, and not the number 4. We sort of do this um, in our brains as programmers all the time, right? So it should be equivalent to something like this. So I rename x and y to a and b, and this function does the same thing. Okay. Still missing the semicolon. Uh, actually, this, this is trickier than it sounds, just doing this. Um, for instance, we want lambda x dot x, alpha equivalent to lambda y dot y. But we do not want lambda x, lambda y x. Alpha equivalent to lambda y, lambda y dot y. Okay. Okay. That's a no. That's bad. Why? Why do I want? Let's think about what these things mean. Um, this is a function that takes a parameter at x and returns a function that takes any parameter and just gives you x back, whatever it was. So this is a thing that produces constant functions. Okay. And we're going to meet. We're going to meet this later um, in a few contexts. This is the function that takes um, anything. And it gives you the identity function. Okay, so, so they're different things, um, and we want our, our uh, language to reflect that, our intuition about that. So again, the first takes value and produces a constant function of that value, while the second returns the identity function no matter what what's passed to it. Okay, so we don't want that. We don't want that. We don't want those to be alpha equivalent. Um, so basically, what you have to do is say, uh, okay, well, mm, you can change x to um, some other variable as long as the variable you change it to. Uh, is not bound somewhere deeper in this expression, in the body of that function, roughly speaking. Okay. Yeah, formally, formally defining it is, you know, more of an adventure, but it's basically um, how that works. Okay, so we can rename variables of, um, of functions. We can rename arguments of functions. That's alpha equivalence. So beta reduction is what is really the meat the engine, the workhorse of the lambda calculus. God, it's a term. I, I hate saying things like that. Uh, beta reduction, yeah, defines the notion of function application. Okay. What is a function with something you can apply to something and get something, right? Okay. However, yeah, to formally define this, we again run into the substitution problem. So in a sense, I view this as, as sort of 
Church kind of looked at the substitution problem, said it's really a dysfunction application, then rigorously defined it once and for all in beta reduction, and then said, okay, there you go. The sense. I don't know. That's my, I mean, that's sort of the feeling I get from the from this case, but whatever. Uh, okay, we would like to define, uh, we would like f applied to x to denote the application of a function f to input x. Note that, um, I guess I'm going beyond variables x and y here, aren't I? Well, actually, I'm not, because f stands for a lambda term, not necessarily a variable. It could be a variable, but it would, again, it doesn't really make sense if it's just a variable. We really think of this as a function, okay? So when I want to think of some lambda term as a function, I write f for g. Because that, you know, provokes the brain into a certain route. Um, even though everything inside is either a term uh, or a variable, which is a type of term. So we would like this to denote um, applying a function f to an input x, which we normally denote um, in modern mathematics as f of x, like the, where the parentheses like this. Well, this is list by c, so you're perfectly happy with this. So I don't have to say anything more. Um, <coughs> let's see with this. I'm just going to show a few examples and then give the just the formal definition. So. Let's uh, apply the identity function to whatever this function is. This weird function right there. Of course, the identity function should just give you whatever its input. So in fact, we're going to take this lambda form, and for every x in the body, we're going to put that lambda form there. And that's it. That's what we're going to do. And the result is exactly what you'd expect. OK? So this expression, right? This expression beta reduces to this expression. Good? We just apply the, apply the identity function. Yes. Okay. Um, whereas if I switch the arguments, um, okay, so now I'm applying this function to this function. Oh, I'm missing a parenthesis. You are missing it. I'm actually, parenthesis. yeah, this is all, this is, oh, boy, this is bad, isn't it? Well, you yeah. said you were going to not always put out of parentheses when you did function. That's true, I did. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the point is I want to apply this, whatever I did here, I want to actually, there's just an extra, whatever. I, this parenthesis should be over there, I guess. So I want to apply this function to this function. Okay. Um, so wherever, wherever I see a y, I'm going to put lambda x dot x in this expression right here. And that looks like that. Again, if, if, if there's something lost, like if you don't see how this is working now, it's a good time to raise your hand because we're just going to build on this. Like, we're going to build on it a lot. Uh, so... Right, so I took lambda x dot x and, and substitute that for both of the y's. So now I have lambda x dot x applied to lambda x dot x. And now I can hit that with another beta reduction, because that's an application. And if I apply the identity function to the identity function, I get the identity function. So those, that's two beta reductions. Mm -hmm. Okay, not bad. Yeah? So this doesn't only allow you to substitute, it also lets you remove the outer lambda. The, oh, yeah, yeah, so that's what I mean by, so, right. You're substituting in the line. Let me, okay, yeah, speaking of that, <coughs> this is sort of, this should be clarified in the next slide. Okay, so we formally define beta reduction, so, um, okay, suppose this is a valid lambda term with T and S valid lambda terms, um, I guess by definition that's that, and X a variable. Um, we can beta reduce this to this, which means the result of replacing, so, we're taking every x that appears in this term t, wherever x appears, and we're going to put s there. Okay? We're just going to find every x and say, okay, there's an x, put whatever there, okay, put that there. Okay, that's, that's it. That's it. And, that's, and this is the common uh, notation for substitution in logic. Okay, it just means, uh, I, think, I think I got it right. Or did, it, did I reverse it? No. No, you got it right. Got it right, good. You got something right. <coughs> uh, yes, take every x and replace it by an s. Uh, okay, so that's that's how the lambda, so this rule makes that lambda go away, exactly. That's so, by this rule, we can just discard the lambda to do that substitution. Beta reduction, that's what it is. Except that it's not every x, but I suppose you'll be coming to that. Yes. Yes. What if our usage of variables? So, we run into similar, um, we run into similar problems as we did with alpha equivalents. Um, and I have a great example. Maybe not so great example, but an example nonetheless. Here's T and S. T, I just wrote that down, lambda Z, uh, and then this X, Y, okay? I didn't say that this had to appear anywhere there, right? Mm -hmm. According to the valid rules of formation of my language, that's valid, okay, I just wrote it down, whatever. No original constant function. Hmm? No original constant This is, yeah, it's a constant function that returns that lambda term. Yeah. Um, and I'm just gonna let S equal Z. 
Uh, so beta reduction says that, okay, uh, I'm gonna apply x dot t to s. Um, so I put in, so what I do is I, for, I, I put in, I write down what t is in this, in this expression and then I'm going to apply it. So uh, here's what t is. So that means that, um, hang on, I did, there's a typo here, sorry. No, 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 this is great, okay. <laughs> Uh, I get really dizzy up here. So for every x, right, we're applying this whole form to um, to z. So for every x, I'm going to put a z in. That's what we're doing. And the result is simply that. There's one x there, and it got transformed to a z. Ooh, all of a sudden, z is being used. Huh? Right? z is now somewhat <laughs> dependent on the parameter. Whereas if I did alpha equivalence first, so right, alpha equivalence, I start off with t as lambda z, blah, 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 blah. So now I change all the z's to a w, as I can. If I do that first, well, gee, if I beta reduce alpha equivalent things, I should get the same thing. If this, you know, I mean, if, unless we're in crazy town. So, um, in fact, look, uh, if you do this reduction now, um, now we have z unused, basically, as an argument. Z is a free variable still, what we call a free variable. It's not bound by anything, okay? So, in fact, this is a constant function that uh, returns the lambda term Zy, whereas the thing on the other slide is the function that takes something and then returns the the, uh, the term with that something right there and then the free term y right there. Okay. So they're different. They should be different things. Yeah. Next slide. Sorry. Yep. Can you, can you go yeah. Back? Thanks. <laughs> okay. Let me know when I can go back. Actually, these slides will be posted too. So. Yeah. No, but not yeah. Okay. Not I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of the game here, but yes. uh, in your definition of substitution, shouldn't you only substitute in the free instances of, of x and t? Um, I think I did that. So, t, so, t yes. So, well, no, 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 I'm going to get to that. <coughs> I didn't really get yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know you're getting to the... Yeah, yeah, x is free and t. Um, okay, yeah, sorry. Okay. Am I correct? No, no. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to run a quantum superposition slide. Okay, so the point is, you have to be a little bit careful how you define beta reduction. Um, so we need to ensure that um, there's no free variable in S that gets bound when you put it in T. Right, X, sorry, it was an X, it was Z. Z started out as a free variable, it wasn't bound by anybody. And then when you put it in that expression, it suddenly became bound. Okay. It sort of changed the meaning of things. So you can't have that happen. So we have to disallow that. Okay. And then also, yeah, you have to, um, um, if x is bound to be a sub-expression, you can't go ahead and then um, do that substitution on it. Okay, so in other words, some care is to, to really define the substitution. <laughs> so right back to the substitution problem, but oh well. Uh, yes? Uh, do you know if how modern interpreters or compilers uh, do, the, do they have, do they have like a separate uh, pass where they, for every bound variable, they go along and they, they reply, they do the alpha reduction with B terms, or there is another way to do it. It's been ages since I've written anything like a compiler, so I'm going to say I don't know. What you said sounds reasonable. Scala definitely does that. Okay. I, I don't think you can do that. You can't, yeah. you can't statically name and then solve all the problems at once because you can create new instances of. Uh, he just said they can. <laughs> well, you can't really be a light on that. That is not the problem. He said you can do it. It's legal. You won't solve all your problems, but you have to be able to do it during the computation. That's fine. You can't do it all at once statically. That's it. Because you, you, can, you, can, you can create new problems <coughs> as you go along. I, I think, I, I like, think I'm the real answer here that. is we like to think with letters and substitution, when you compile it down, you tend to get to representations that are very different, and that you would, and that by construction have um, a lot of the properties you want. And there's fields of research about the various nice ways to do it that um, we can talk about after this talk. Maybe. Yes, this is a tough conversation. About yeah, we're just screwing things on paper, but yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. But I think, given that we're just scribbling things on paper, I've got a substitution defined enough to go forward. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, the next reduction captures extensionality, which is another thing, which is a fancy word for something you already know. Um, we say that two functions are extensionally equal if they do the same thing. That is, they take the, the same values to the same values. Okay. Do the same thing, but apply them to different values. 
Um, and it's, it's like this. So, um, be more careful with my math arrays to make the uh, equalities line up. But <coughs> apart from that, um, I define f of x as x plus 2 and g of x as x plus 1 plus 1. Well, I wrote down two different things, so in a sense, they're different, right? I mean, I just wrote down two different things. Oh, but they have to do the same thing when I, whenever I put an x into them. So they're extensionally equal. Yes? What if you get an infinite loop? I don't know what an infinite loop means yet. <laughs> Not there. Not there. I, mean, I can define a function which is which spawns a computation in a process which never stops. So we don't even know what a process is yet, though. We're gonna get there. Yeah, I'll have an infinite loop coming. So let's let's save it to that. Um, so these are two different functions, and they're essentially equal. These are just math functions, right? From from ninth grade or from eighth grade or whatever. Uh, however, I mean, this isn't necessary to talk. It's always bothered me in pre-calculus. These are neither equal nor extensionally equal, but algebraically reduced to the same thing. Right? After all, what is <laughs> Wait, I have to say something. Yes, you can say something. But this is the only thing. Oh, well no. <laughs> this is where algebraic geometry Yes, begins. exactly. He's, he's actually, this man is so correct. Wow. Yes, so in other words, we're looking at <coughs> There's a difference between the ring of rational functions and the ring of, anyway, whatever, right, so. Right. <laughs> and then we'll go to arithmetic schemes and have a really great time, but we're not going to do that. So, that's enough math. Okay. So, so uh, eta conversion says that, um, basically, oh, here's, here's a kind of a miracle of this subject. It's kind of a miraculous, at least. Um, if, you, if you put in this rule, okay, you, if you say that this rule is eta equivalent to this, so what is it saying? The function that takes an x and applies f to that x. It is the same thing as f. Okay? f is the same thing as the function that takes x and applies f to x. Um, this one rule suffices to capture all the, like, you can show that the whole theory is extensional from this rule. Just one rule. Okay, you might think you'd have to do more than that, like abstract it and make it all work, um, from what we defined so far, but this actually suffices. That was one thing that Curry actually proved. Yes? Ooh. Does beta reduction also allow you to do this, or are you implicitly eta converting in your beta? Ah, there's no beta reduction here because I'm not. This is not an application. Okay. Yes, beta reduction only applies to applic so terms that are applications. But the way you wrote beta reduction, you were beta reducing and then eta converting to remove the other lambda. Mm, you no. Know. Okay. okay. Both. They both. Both of them. <coughs> uh, both of them involve removing lambda, but they're different things. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Does that proof have a name? Yeah. Is it the? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's on a slide. I think it's on a slide towards the end of the talk. Is that the isomorphism thing? Right? Um, what's this called? This part of the is this was, did it, was this a step in the church roster theorem? I'm trying to remember. All right. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. What's it in name? Church roster just says it doesn't matter what order. Yes, church roster is the, the is that the confluence. Yeah. But we'll get we'll talk about. It. There's some high-minded slides at the end when we're done talking about. Uh, which is gonna be great. Okay. Any other questions? It doesn't contain the variable x free? Um. Uh, wait. This is it. Yes. Not contain the variable x. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's enough math. Okay, I guess we did. I don't know if that's math or not, but um, we can now start writing programs. And the first program I'm going to do is this. Uh, which we all do as beginning programmers. <laughs> so, or at any level of programming, I guess. Maybe less so when you're more advanced, but um, I don't know. Here's a program. But I'm, it's actually, I guess I'm already making identification between programs and lambda terms, which might be specious, but let's run with it. Uh, what does this do? Well, okay, I'm going to apply this function to this function. Okay, so now for every x, I take this function and put that in there. So what do I get, anybody? <laughs> the same, <Luke>. the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so you successfully put an infinite loop. Great. I mean, infinite in the sense you can keep beta reducing it, and uh, it just keeps going on and on and on. Um, so yeah, this true strength of line of is the speed at which we can write down infinite computations. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the speed at which they are evaluated depends on your processor and platform. <laughs> Um, so some computers will get to infinity faster. Some computers will get to infinity faster. It's true. Okay. Uh, I think. Actually, <laughs> I got to go into reducer as a 
program which generates itself. Um, okay. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. So this is, is this a Klein? I don't know. I guess it, it's, when you write down a Klein and Klein and scheme, you do that quotation to prevent it from continuing this sentence, right? So I guess if you took this up and dressed it up with some quotes, you'd get a Klein. But I, I don't know, I think this is something that just keeps going and going and going, but I don't know. What's a Klein? It's a Klein. It's it's program. It's program. It's program. It's program. It's program. itself. Named that for the guy who put quotation marks into logic. Yeah. Ah, I didn't know that. It goes, okay. I'm sorry. So, you see, this is all before the age of quotation marks. I mean, this is what makes it seem more interesting. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, define client. It's a program that opens itself. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hofstetter calls it a risk of A what? A risk of coining. A risk of coining. <laughs> well, Hofstetter is very good. Um, and very interesting. Oh, uh, I don't know why that's off center, but anyway, so here's another one. Uh, this is fun. So, I don't know, right? These are both valid lambda terms. Um, I'm missing the outer parentheses to do beta reduction, but by now you know my, my whole system of parentheses, so I just want to reduce this by beta reduction to the two outer terms. And, um, well, let's see, for every x here, I'm going to put this thing there, and what happens when I do that? Well, you get something bigger. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, it gets bigger, and if you keep doing this, it gets even bigger and goes off the page. Okay. So I don't think we make programs that repeat themselves. We get make things that just get bigger, um, and eventually you'll run out of ink. Wonderful. But actually, it's interesting. Both of these examples are pretty interesting because they show that not all lambda terms normalize. Okay, which roughly means um, you can. You'd like to intuitively, you'd like to be able to take a lambda term and just keep whacking it with reductions until you get, you know, until you're done. Well, you may never be done. Okay, there might not be a prize at the end. At the bottom. At the bottom. There's nothing at the bottom. <coughs> Turbo's all the way down. <coughs> okay. All right. So now we've successfully written some non-trending programs. So we'd like to do more interesting things than that, probably. So uh, I'm now going to define numbers, booleans and conditionals, and recursion. And once we do that, we can do anything, right? Hopefully. Good enough. Um, so what I'm actually going to do now is take your intuitive notion of what natural numbers are and then formalize them within this lambda system. And if you're accustomed to looking at uh, word size 32 bits and, and looking at that as ints, then this should be fine. Okay. You already do this transformation in your head in similar other formal, well, quasi-formal systems anyway, so this is just another one. Um, the intuition behind it is the number n is n-fold composition. Which is a non-terminating definition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. The zero's got to be in there somewhere. <laughs> nah, don't worry about it. I like my integers non well found. Uh, that's really weird. Okay, so actually, no, never mind. Um, slightly less cyclic, well, actually, not really less cyclic, but the number n is a function that takes a function and returns the n-fold composite of that function. Okay. Yeah, it's still kind of cyclic, but we'll. we'll, we'll uh, Fix that. So intuitively, this is intuition. I'm writing this in the world of math. This is not. This does not exist in our formal system yet until I do this. But this is the intuition that n, which I boldface, uh, is something that takes a function and then gives you this. And there's meant to be n of these things, except I forgot how to do that in LaTeX. So I figured I'd just save the time. <laughs> sorry. What do the circles mean? Composition. Yeah. Okay. yeah oh, sorry. Actually, these should be centered. I said, yeah. Uh, f, cir f circle f generally denotes f composed with f. Um, which we sometimes know as that, but I'm never going to use that again in the talk, so why bother writing it down? Okay, formal. <coughs> now, triple equals, uh, this is sort of nonsense, but that's fine. Um, look, this <laughs> is a formal system, I, this is a symbol I wish to define. Okay, and the idea is that whatever I define it as, when you see that symbol, when I write it down, you can replace whatever I define it with, okay? This is what it's supposed to mean in terms of mathematics. So I'm actually conflating syntax and semantics with it, whatever. This is what it's supposed to be to mathematics. It means it takes a function after the identity function. That's what zero is. After all, the zeroth fold composition of a function is simply the identity function. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, doing f zero times is like just okay. You don't do f. Right? Uh, okay, formally, this is what that is. Take a function and return the identity function. Yes. If you take the cursor out. It tends to confuse. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, what's, what's that symbol? What's that symbol? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. That's all zero is. It's a function that takes function and returns the identity function. Um, well, what's one? 
Well, um, doing f once is just f, right? So we take a function f, and we take an argument x. So, the, sorry, we take a function f, we return a function that takes x and applies f to it. So it's eta all over again. It's eta all over again. I could eta reduce this, but um, it, it's better if I don't, because we want to generalize this bit. Um, OK, so 2 is a function that takes a function and returns the twofold composite, which looks like that. So take a function, return a function that takes a parameter and applies that basically applies f twice to it. Yes? So these are all lambda functions that don't have arguments in this case. Uh, lambda f. Yes. <coughs> f is the argument. Twice. F is the argument, yeah. This is taking a function. Oh, we, sorry. Sorry, this is okay. something we yeah, think of as a function. Yeah, okay. Taking a lambda term, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taking a lambda term, we think of as a function from our intuition. Sorry, yeah. And okay. gives you a function, or whatever this turns out to be. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. And but I'm just going to keep calling them functions because you usually think that way. Um, and then gives you that. Should we say that, because f must be a variable syntactically here, but the intent is that it will be a function. Yeah, for, so that's why I said, I mean, x and, okay, so I, I fix some fix some nice alphabet of variables and then yeah. So okay, I, I'm gonna add f to my set of variables. Any variable that I start using, I'm just gonna add. Yeah, I didn't I didn't rigorously define the set of my domain set of variables. But, uh, you can do that. And so on. Okay. Well, what does so on mean? Um, well, we can define it like this. So. Zero is that, which we saw from the previous slide. So on uh, means that if n is a natural number, n plus one, which we didn't notice is the successor of n, mm -hmm. is that. So what's the successor of n? Well, we do f n times. Um, apply that to our argument, and then we f again. And that's the f plus n fold composite. Okay. We'll define the successor function. So I defined a handful of numbers on the previous slide, but now I've shown, oh, you, know, you can make all sorts of numbers. At least for any number, you can make another one. So that should be plenty for you. Um, oh, let's have some fun. So um, one should be the successor of zero, which is, now this is where things, this is where, Mistakes are probably. <laughs> it's going to get worse, trust me. It's going to get much worse. Uh, oh, God. All right. So, I just formally, what I did, here's what I did. Okay. I took, I took this, which is sort of, okay, this triple equal sign means sort of notationally equivalent. Mm -hmm. Okay? Which is. So, the same like on Thursdays. What? <laughs> like on Thursdays. On Thursdays. Well, no, it's, well, it's notationally equivalent. I think we also have that as definition equal. So, he's asking if it's judgmental. Oh, yes. I'm not going to say the word judgmental, but yes, I think. I don't understand it. I still don't understand it enough to say yes or no. Uh, so, okay. For those of you that were missing the next discussion, the word. Uh, right. So, I mean, this is definitionally, definitionally equal, so you can basically just say rule of, um, of syntactic substitution in a sense. Substitution. Uh, it's always, it's everywhere. But yeah. Um, so basically, I'm going to write, I'm going to write this form down right here, and I'm going to put the number zero there. This definition. Okay, I'm going to write that. I'm just going to put that there um, and get that right there. Um, well, what is zero? It's that, right? Zero. Mm -hmm. I, for zero, I substituted um, the function. It takes a function and then returns the identity function. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, let's do some reduction. So I think the next thing I do, and it doesn't matter what order you do reductions, by the way. Uh, or, it can make. Okay. So I'm going to apply this to f, mm -hmm. um, which does nada. Or, well, by nada, I mean get the identity function back. Okay, now I'm going to apply the identity function to x. And lo and behold, I have, um, yes, lambda f, lambda x, f apply to x. Which is exactly what we defined as 1 from the couple slides ago. Mm -hmm. So, so far, what I've shown you is at least consistent. Mm -hmm. Well, so far, it looks, looks good enough. Mm -hmm. I'm just showing you the bits that are, you know. That the inconsistency is not as good. Uh, yes, that looks good, doesn't it? Okay, it's probably the only one that's actually correct, but let's see. Um, and then, okay, um, we can reduce. I don't know why I did this. Uh, I don't, what did I do 
that for. Hey, ignore those. Yeah, I was thinking of something else. Ignore those. Doesn't count. Doesn't count. Yes, that was correct. All right. Um, I'll fix the slides when we're close. So you notice that I suddenly started using all that slide that I've been using for a few slides. Um, this is a definitional equivalence where I'm declaring by fiat that wherever you write A, you can write B, vice versa. That's all I mean by that. Um, it's outside of the language. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and success, I can actually define, instead of, instead of like writing something down, successor and is equal to, I can actually write down successor as a lambda term. Because okay. mm -hmm. actually, technically what I wrote down, what I still wrote down a successor a couple of slides ago was sort of nonsense. Um, okay. Well, it's basically using some like the error rule. Yeah, but it doesn't. Lambda and this. Yeah, but I'm using it as a Successor and equals this, and say successor equals lambda and whatever. I am, but it's sort of using it in the meta language, which we can't, yeah, which we can't really do. Which, well, we don't know we can, okay. Whatever, this is what successor is. <laughs> this is what successor is, right there. It takes an N. Um, not in boldface, because now it's just a uh, language, it's just a variable, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, takes an N, takes an F, takes an X, and does that. Okay. And then if you happen to feed it something that we regard as a number, you'll get a number back from what I, well, I just defined it that way, didn't I? Uh -huh. um, Yes, so here n is not bold faces, I'm using it as a variable. And our user, yes, can, can put anything there. Um, but we're only going to guarantee good output, good output if you give us good input, so whatever that means. Anyway, we have natural numbers. Um, can you now you define? Have, you have more than natural numbers? Can we just define all numerable sequences? Uh, well, hmm, um, no, well, depends on what you mean by numerable, so. <laughs> Countable, I guess. Yeah. Except that you don't have all countable ordinals. Well, you will generate right. ordinals. Not all countable ordinals, but you can get omega. Yeah. Cool. There's lots of countable ordinals out there. Um, like, like epsilon naught. It's a terrifying ordinal. Anyway. Uh, n plus m takes a function and composes it n plus m times, right? According to our intuition. Um, so let's write a lambda term. So we're going to define addition. So let's write a lambda term that applies f m times, and then. It applies at n times. Okay, so that's how we're going to try to write this down. Um, so, and that means composition. So, there you go. Um, <coughs> we're going to look at look at this part. Uh, we're going to apply the nth fold composite of f to x, <laughs> and then take the result and feed it to the nth fold composite of f. And therefore, we will have done f n plus n times. Mm -hmm. This I had to crack on the uh, subway here. So. <laughs> Lucky for you all. Uh, anyway. So, yes! Okay, first of all, is there any questions about this? I'm going to use it in the next mm -hmm. slide. And you'll have to become less confused or more confused. I don't know. Uh, let's prove that 2 plus c was 4. Um, actually, it's not going to be equal to 4, it's going to be equivalent to 4. Or I guess you could say that 2 plus 2 and 4 normalize the same thing, something like that. Uh, okay. So let's start off with um, adding 2 to 2. And we're going to put in the definition of add. I hope this isn't off the page. We'll see. Uh, we'll put in the definition of add, which is just this monstrosity. And I just put um, the 2's there. So we'll apply this. We'll beta reduce this. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about reduction strategies yet. Uh, but basically, for every n I see, I'm going to put the, put the 2 there. Uh, sorry. Yes. I'm a little confused by the, what, in the first line. We don't see add the, the result of add two, uh, add applied to that and two. Why do we see okay. add just once? Huh? Uh, are you, 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 you current add with that tone is you current? I'm current. Everything's current. Yeah, but you can say you don't have error. Have you said n plus n? So you didn't say. No, oh, but okay. Yeah, I guess I did. Um, yeah, everything's current. Sorry. Is everybody okay with that? Is everybody okay with that? This is like an Indian restaurant, everything's turning on. Sorry, it's bad. <laughs> bad restaurant. Um, right. This, I'm, and it, we're all functional programmers, we're all happy with this. Um, or some of us are good, whatever. Okay, so yes, let's beta reduce. For every n, I put a 2. We'll beta reduce again. For every m, I'll put another 2. And oh god, I, I meant, there was supposed to be a pause there, I apologize. So now we end up with this, 
And then if we expand the twos, we end up with this monstrosity right there. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> uh, so let's see what I do here. This is where you know you've got to be careful. So um, if I apply this form to f, I get lambda x f f x, and if I do the same here, I think that's what I do next. Yes. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. Now, what am I going to do? Yes. Now I'm going to apply this term to this term. So for every x, I'm going to put in this guy right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. First, first I'm going to reduce this. Um, that is, I'm going to apply this function to this x and simply get uh, that back. So f of f of x. Now I'm going to take f of x of x, f of f of x, and put it in there. And then I get four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we've proven that two plus two is equal to four. And how much White and Russell took about a hundred pages to do it. It's true. White and Whitehead and Russell, you have to take about a hundred pages. Yes, a, lot, a long time to prove this. So we're, we're already ahead of Russell. Mm -hmm. We're already doing much better than Russell and Whitehead. Um, good for us. Okay. All right, what about multiplication? Well, yeah, as you can see, <laughs> easy. Let's skip to exponentiation. Oh, yeah, exponentiation is actually easy, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you did acronyms. But I'm uh, not doing acronyms function. Sure. I should have done acronyms function. I mean, that would have been fun, right? Uh, I'm going to do something cheesy at the end. You're going you're gonna to be disappointed. I'm sorry. It's pretty, anyway. Um, n times n is a function that returns the n times n fold composite. So you sort of make the nth composite of f n times. So I, that's how this like is in my mind, um, which looks like that. Take the nth fold composite, uh, make that n times, and now apply that to my else. Okay. So it, actually, if you're for those of you following along at home, really the difference between addition and multiplication is just sort of where you put the parentheses, right? Both <laughs> uh, addition. Yeah, I mean multiplication is generalized addition, so yeah. Um, and of course, yeah, we all know it's all about the parentheses, right? So, um, um, yeah, I'm not going to do that. So, uh, yes, exactly. The proof is so, the, I, I, it's a very simple proof, but it's not been in the margins. Can't do it. So, you can do that if you want I'm on the train right home. Um, exponentiation is kind of, I don't know, this English sentence is probably terrible. I should just do the formalism, but let's see. Oh, uh, I get n to the n, apply n to m. What is that, y? Okay, so m takes a function, returns the n fold composite. So now we take the, uh, the n fold composite of the function that takes a function and returns the n fold composite. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Somebody said yes, so I'm going to continue. Um, the, the formalism is easier to see. So now we have a function that takes n gives blah. Um, here's the idea. Um, if we apply n to n, we get m n times. Okay, we're doing m n times. So we're taking the nth composite n times. So it's m times n, mm -hmm. uh, which, um, oh, which went off the screen. Crap. <coughs> so uh, it looks like this. Well, okay. You can already write it down, right? But um, isn't that, isn't that uh, multiplication? No. Oh wait, is it? No, it's exponentiation. You're multiplying the m, but then you're uh, applying it. So the mul so your multiplication yeah. one level up is exponentiation. Precisely, it's one level up for exponentiation. Yeah, yeah. Comp this is like multiplication. It's multiplication for multiplication. Yeah, it's multiplication. Yeah. Multiplication. Yeah. multiplication. Uh, so this is like, oh yeah, lambda n, lambda m, uh, n m of f of x. Okay, like that. Um, which is great because you can all see that. But whatever, you can write it down. Um, okay. So fraction is very tricky, but actually you do some interesting things on the way to defining it um, because we'll start getting into category theory. So we'll have pairs. I don't know. That or means consoles, we like to call them in this room. What's that? Or consoles, we like to call them. Consoles. <laughs> oh, consoles. Yes. Okay. Consoles. Yes. Right. This is. Oh, I forget my audience. Um, okay. Uh, so we have to define the opposite of incrementing. I'm going to define the predecessor function and then leave it to your imagination that you can define subtraction more generally. Um, okay, so instead of incrementing x and x plus 1, let's define what pairs are. And then have a way of taking n comma n 
to m comma n plus one. Okay? It should be obvious. It should not be that obvious where I'm going. Well, it might be obvious where I'm going to some of you, but just bear with me. Um, if you iterate that on zero, you get this thing. And then notice that every uh, index of this, if you like, uh, has a number in its predecessor. Okay. So if we can do all this, all then we have to do is do this n times and then take the, the first projection, take the first argument. So in other words, if we want the predecessor of 3, we do whatever this is, blah, 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 3 times, and then um, plug out the number 2 from that pair. And that's how we're going to define predecessors. Mm -hmm. Really efficient, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it was going to be efficient. Uh, of course, the consequence is that the predecessor of 0 is 0. Mm. Um, I'm not going to say any more about that. So, <laughs> how's that for efficiency? So, um, how do we do this? Well, what do we need? We need pairs. I need that this weird addition, this, this operation here. And then I need to be able to project to the coordinates of the pairs, either the first or second coordinate. Okay, so now I'm going to do a little side detour and do all that. Um, how do we make pairs? Oh. Um, yeah, okay, it turns out, okay, well, we're going to get there. <laughs> I should, I should have said the word console somewhere. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, we're, first gonna, we're first gonna define Boolean's and conditionals. Um, so, all right, there's, there's true. Uh, okay, so it's getting a little weirder. So remember this function from back like 10, 30 slides ago? Um, that's what true is. It's the function that takes a um, something and then returns the constant function to that something. False is that. So true remembers what you gave it and false forgets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <All right>. Cool. <laughs> How are you like And then, ah, uh, there's a cons. Yeah. So I was thinking of this audience. Um, so now that I'm uh, missing a parenthesis, sorry. Uh, now that I've got true and false, con takes something, takes which we, which we think of as a condition or a Boolean value or something that reduces to true or false. Um, take something that should be reduced to if it's true, take something that should be reduced to if it's false, and then does that. So, this actually does the right thing if you think about it. So if you put true in here, um, then true is going to take the t and remember it, take your true result and remember it, and then it's going it, to, you know, it's just going to give you that back when you apply um, to whatever this is, and it's going to forget that false thing. Whereas false, it's going to forget this thing that you passed to it and return that. Okay, when you apply mm -hmm. con to the to true or false. Okay. So it's a weird definition, but it kind of works. Mm -hmm. right. Um, where am I going with this? <laughs> Good question. Oh yeah. To make a pair, we store them in a con. And then to get one or the other, we can just evaluate it on true or false. <laughs> con. <laughs> I, I know you yeah. did, but I'm saying that it could look a little less. Oh, I'm kind of, I guess I'm kind of defining cons in terms of con in a way. Isn't this more like an either? It's or? more like an if. It's more like an either. It's an if, yeah. I mean, if that, okay. okay. Most, most texts will denote this as if that else. But I mean, is that what con is in this? Well, is, well, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's multiple. Cons. Right. But anyway, yeah. yeah. Con is it. Right, yeah. Right. So you okay. can make cons out of con. You can make cons out of con. Okay. Con I don't want to. Alright, alright. Uh, yes, that's what pair is. So, um, oh boy, I made another mistake. I'm sorry. So pair, this should be a T, because I want to make a pair of S and T. Mm -hmm. um, takes a T and takes an S, and then returns this lambda, um, which takes the truth value, and then there's this expression. So in other words, if you pass in, let's see, if you pass in true, okay, I kind of reverse this. So in this, in this implementation, if you pass in true, you'll actually get um, the second thing that you gave it. If you pass in false, you'll get T back. So you probably would want to reverse that. Uh, is, uh, is, your, is your truth value is actually car and your false value is cover? Oh yeah, that's a nice way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, but seriously, I mean, you can't actually get um, both elements of the pair at the same time. What does that at the same time mean? You can duplicate it. You can duplicate it, yeah. You're not mutating it, it's just mm -hmm. the term. You can apply it four times to get them, whatever you want four times out. Yeah, so since, um, what I've done here is to find products. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you need to find one value or the other value. Yes. Um, although I don't, it's not really ethers or sums, right? So this is more, this is really just products, tuples. Really. Could, you, could you go back to the quantum definition? Yes, I can. 
Isn't it's... the con definition is exactly the pair? Is what? Isn't your con definition is exactly well, the pair? It's just the reversal of order of all units to it. Why would you? If, if you put I, the CF and the TNF, yeah. that's a bad pair. Right. Uh, and then yes. passing, passing a truth value to car would, would, would work as a car, and then passing the false would work as a. Well, so, right, so strangely, car could already function that feed this state, lambdas that feed this true and false. Um, Right. In this case, the, so the condition comes before the truth and the false, semantically in our heads, right? But we want something that takes two things and then takes a condition, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we're sort of we're making a con and remembering its environment. Oh, okay. yeah. And of course, f is equal to t here. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, at least these are all sort of minor so far, right? Nothing, uh, nothing stinking at all. So I guess it's like using closures to store stuff, um, if you want to think of it that way. but. Um, oh yes, my pair increment function, <laughs> which I'm going to call pair increment. <coughs> uh, so I take the second, I make a pair, I take a pair, and I make a pair um, consisting of the second thing from that pair and the successor of the first thing from that pair. So what do I do? Yes. I think that's correct. <laughs> um, so I can do that. I've got projections. So now I can define predecessor. Um, what do I do? I take the n-fold pair permit of the pair of 0 and 0, and then take the first argument of it, take the first element of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, So this corresponds to the, the, what I wrote down in terms of math a couple slides ago. Whew. I've got predecessor. Can you go back to the other slide one more time? <laughs> <laughs> no, I right. uh, which slide? This one, yeah. This one, okay. This one more time. Right. I might have reversed, I don't know if I'm, I'm trying to see if I reversed, I think something got twisted. Mm -hmm. There's not trivial homology here, but, uh, <laughs> but if you, can, you can untangle that. And, uh, yes? There's a the story I read. Oh, okay. Um, it was written by S.C. Cleaning. Ah. Cleaning was working with the church. They just discovered this. The church had just, I mean, it's an action, they'd, they'd written up something, the church had written up something before, and realized it had a nonsense. And, so he said, I'm going to do just the lambda calculus. So they're working away at it. They get, they get arithmetic, except for a few weeks, they couldn't figure out how to do predecessors. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. You can try, like, you can, like, on the subway, okay. which is a good exercise, like, <laughs> use the intuition for add mold and, and exponentials and write it down. Which is one. You can do that. Think hard enough. Start, like you start like using your hand, like just trying to figure out what predecessor. Did. It's really hard. They thought at toward the end of that time, according to Cleaney, that they'd shown that the thing was not no basis for the mutable function because they both conjectured that it could not be done. So the original, the original. All oh, right, that's interesting. It was that hard. Yeah. And then Cleaney got it while well, under the influence of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> according, according to him. <laughs> all right. Did you, did you like to test good. this with lambda unit? What? <laughs> um, wait, no, what's no, the, what? No lambda unit, huh? What's lambda unit? What? Unit tested, you know. Oh, unit testing, yeah. <laughs> I haven't unit tested this, sorry. None of the code that I've written here is unit tested or probably correct, but. Um, oh, yeah, we can detect when something's zero. This is kind of cute. Right? I mean, we have conditionals that take true or false, but we don't have anything that really returns true or false, right? Um, so, let's see. Take an n, we want to see if it's zero. Well, I take the n-fold composite of the function that returns false. Well, if you take the n-fold composite of a function of a constant function, you just get a constant function. Except if you take the zero-fold composite, you just get the identity function. And then we'll apply that to true. <laughs> nice. Wow. Right? Winner. Winner, yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. All right. Um, yes, we have conditionals in arithmetic now. Go us. So now we can do anything. That's a lot of hard work. Um, and we could, oh, with pairs, we can find the rationals. I'm not going to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no algebra and geometry today. Uh, oh, yeah, now we, there's that other thing. We need a way of looping or recursion. You're doing something over and over and over again, possibly unboundedly many times. Uh, um, so, OK, you've, you've probably all read this story. You, so, Various contexts. At least, like, I don't know, I feel like the, the literature that explains the Y combinator is not as bad as the literature that explains monads, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. So, 
I'm going to give you an account of it, and if you like it, I hope, well, I don't know. we'll see what happens. Um, we need a function to call itself to do recursion. Uh, there's no notion of variable binding, really. Uh, yet for that, we, that we've encountered. So all we have are ways of constructing things, constructing lambda terms. Okay, there's no official variable binding. Again, um, remember that triple equals, that judgmental equality, I mean definitional equality that I defined earlier, <laughs> really it's just at the meta language, so you can't like use that as a binder or within can an you, expression. Yes? Yeah. Can you define the successor function with this way? Um, I, I originally, no, 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 I don't. No, I didn't. Um, yeah, successor is not defined with first Because okay. it just takes, take the nth to positive f, and then do f again. Yes. I'm, I'm a little confused because you said there's no notion of variable binding, but the original discussion of reduction was in terms of whether things are free or bound. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Binding is not good here. Um, the only thing that binds thing is lambda. Yeah. Um, and then. Maybe you could say that there's no global variable. No top level, yeah. There's no top level binding. Thank you. That's probably what I, that's what I meant. I think it's. Yes. Right. Okay. I, I think There's no top level finding. I think it was in other terms, in order to have recursion, you can't have anonymous functions, and that would have to be anonymous functions. Yeah, so all we have are anonymous functions right now, and it's unclear as to how we would do recursion with them. We just, yeah. There's no, yeah, there's no top level binding. I like that. I'll change this slide. Um, how do we do this? Well, here we go. Um, Okay, so you've all heard of this. It's not, in fact, in addition to being a venture capital company, it's also a mathematical term. It's, it's also a Latin term, that's right. Now you know where they got it from. Um, okay, there's a bunch of explanations, and here's one of them. It's a burrito. Well, I thought it was like a burrito dust. Okay, there's, 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 so half of you know that's what what, did I, what am I doing? Okay, let's start with the first function. Yes, yeah, so if you saw my other talk at Haskell NYC, you might think that all I talk about is the factorial function. That's not far from the truth, but um, let's talk about it again. In fact, I did the same thing with the factorial function at Haskell in my, uh, my talk at the Haskell talk, only I did it using denotational semantics. This I'm going to do syntactically. So there's, for those of you who, weather, who are weathering both of these talks, that's your, that's your prize. Mm -hmm. your um, so here's factorial, it takes an n, um, checks if it's zero, if it is, evaluate to one. Uh, otherwise, um, I think there should not, oh, well, okay, yeah, right, okay. Uh, con is curry, remember, everything's curry. Um, otherwise, uh, multiply, multiply the number n by fact of the predecessor of n. Okay, that's factorial. Well, I mean, it's BS because, I, you know, this isn't, this is not a lambda term yet. I mean, the problem is here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, if you were to take that, well, what would happen if you were to take that as a definitional equality? You'd be sitting there writing for a very long time. You'd just be substituting it. Oh, what's fact again? Oh, it's this. Oh, I guess I'll write that down again. Oh, another fact. Oh, I guess I'll keep writing. So, um, well, what if we pass a function in that's supposed to mean factorial? Uh, in other words, I don't know, this is maybe not a good explanation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what if you were to represent, take this thing which exists in the middle language and somehow represent it as an f that we can pass in, and then simply, in our recursive step, apply f. So take, multiply n by the result of applying f to n minus 1, which f is supposed to mean factorial. Okay. That's, the, that's the strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Can you use con conditional values? Yeah, con is the base. Yeah, exactly. Uh, con is the base of what? Actually, no. So con, con, you, con is at every step. Right. Um, but at some point, you're going to need base. At some point, you're going to yeah. I mean, well, if you if you if you give it a number, if you give it a positive number, eventually you'll hit the base. It is eventually you'll hit the base case. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, what did I write that? Yeah. Okay. Not, let's skip that. Okay. Suppose we had a magic function g, such that g is equivalent to fact of g. And um, I'm just going to show you what would happen if we had that function. And this is going to be my, so again, at Haskell I'll give you the fixed point um, of, a, of, a, you know, of a higher order function of, over a Scott domain to explain this. I'm just now going to pair it with symbols and suppose that this, suppose we can do this. And I'm sure you, in fact, we can do it. Um, 
Well, if you did something like this, okay, so again, we're running over the hypothesis that we can find a G such that um, G is equivalent to fact of G. Or actually, it's very important that fact of G reduces to, sorry, the G reduces to fact of G. That's really the, uh, the clutch. Um, not just equivalent, but G in fact reduces to fact of G. So we'll start off there. Um, we'll, we'll take fact of G, then apply to number four. Uh, expand fact of G. We're just expanding the whole thing. Well, fact is this, and um, bugger. So, oh yeah, good. Here's fact, and we're going to apply it to G, and then apply the result of that to four. Okay. <coughs> so wherever you see an F, put a G. So we've got now G of part of N right there. So now let's apply it again. Beta reduction on the outside, and we get that form. Okay. I'm skipping again. This is not this. This is not the, at the level of, of the level of rigor that we that we showed two plus two is equal to four with. Because I'm sort of using symbols, but. Um, at least this way it fits on one slide. So uh, Tom is going to go ahead and say, well, um, 4 is not 0, so we're going to get this term when we do that reduction um, right there. Uh, what's that going to do? Well, right 4 is really 3. I'm just going to write it as a bold phase 3 because we know what that is now. Um, but g reduces to fact of g. Let me do that again, ready? <laughs> G itself reduces to fact of G. So we can continue. Yeah? How do you like that? Magic. Pretty good. Magic G. It's pretty good, right? Um, so, okay, now hopefully I've convinced you that if we have such, if we can sort of produce magic G's for things that we define like fact, we can now do recursion. Okay, because so now we can. Remember, we, we started off with fact of g of 4, and now we have the multiplication of n times fact of g of 3. Oh, great! As we can see, that if we kept hammering this around, eventually this con is going to evaluate to 1, and we'll have our factorial. Okay. You wanted to replace n by 4. Right? Oh, no. Yes, I did. You're right. Um, yes, n should be somehow, because I didn't beta reduce correctly. Mm -hmm. I apologize. So all those n's and the should be lines. Uh, Multiply 4 by the fact of j. 4, 4, 4, 4. Yes, that's what that should be. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so in fact, um, a magic g is what's called a fixed point of fact, as I've defined it. A fixed point of a function is nothing strange. It's simply, if, if f is a function, again, I'm, I'm reverting to math notation to convey intuition, yeah? So it's simply a variable like x that, um, that goes to itself under f. So, if f of x is equal to x squared, then 0 and 1 are the fixed points of f. 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, um, for example. If f is the identity, the identity function, everything is a fixed point. Okay. So um, there is a lambda term that will compute the fixed point of any other lambda term. <laughs> <coughs> it's called the y combinator. And there are several flavors of it. Um, the most common looks like that. Hopefully wait, I got that one. Wait. No, I didn't get it right. So... Wait, wait. What? Wait. What? Does every function have a fixed point? Oh, God. All right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ignore that. Ignore that. Ignore that. Ignore that. Scott sets. Ignore that. Okay. I will ignore that. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think I messed this up. So this should be an F. I apologize. And the function of it. Yeah, that should be F. We're at okay, G is equal to F in this slide. Ah, that's really terrible because it's sort of like a high point. Right? All right, that looks really neat. Let's see why that works. Um, yes, so let's show that for any H. Um, y of H, which is going to be the supposed fixed point of H, is in fact equal to H of Y of H. Okay? And then we'll apply it to the successor function. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Point. You can do that later. <laughs> At the bar, a fixed point. A fixed point. <laughs> a fixed point can be a sequence, right? No, or, uh, a possibly infinite sequence. No. Um, so there's y of h. There's y. Well, okay. Well, okay. I copy and pasted. The problem with copying and pasting is that we have replicator. So I'm really sorry. So these should be f's again. But now we're going to beta reduce anyway. There you go. <laughs> 
Now we're in the book. That's magic beta readers. Magic. This is all magic. So now we're going to take this this lambda form, this lambda term, and apply it, beta reduce it with this thing. Ah, uh, I don't know if I can make this point out because I screwed this up, but actually. Um, for those of you who pay attention at home, notice that if you beta reduce the inside first, well, um, eh, okay, we're not going to go very far. So in fact, um, the, the strategy in which you use to reduce things really does matter um, in terms of getting places. Um, okay, anyway. So, um, are, there, are there names for the different strategies? Oh, there are names for the different oh, yeah. strategies. <laughs> for example? Uh, there's, let's see, there's what, outer applicative, which says I'm going to always um, beta reduce with the outer outermost variable. Um, you can make that, you can make like call by name semantics out of that by just taking the entire, by not reducing that, by not reducing this first and just putting it in there. Um, you can make call by value semantics by reducing this first and then putting it in there. Yeah. Optimal reduction order. Optimal order, no. oh. <laughs> sure. Well, so, so, so in the lambda calculus, I where it's formally defined, yeah. does it tell you which of these? No. 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 The lambda calculus is unprejudiced as to what you do. Yeah. It's up to you, the program. <laughs> <laughs> okay, or the, I guess the compiler or something, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so if we take uh, this term and then put it wherever we see an x, we get, well, that. Um, which is exactly um, h of y of h. Right, so this this thing is y of h, and now I'm going to apply h to it, so we've got h of y of h back. Yeah, okay. It's kind of like, it looks like the thing that just repeated over and over again, only now we're doing work, I guess. I don't know, it's one way of thinking about Because we're doing this, we have this other application. Or this other, yeah. I don't know. Whatever. I like the semantic, I like the denotational semantics. Churchill has a nice piece on this Winston Churchill. <laughs> What is it, Jay? <laughs> I, I, I just read the whole thing um, last night. I've known about part of it, but not of it, for, for 30 years. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to the list. OK. Because, and, but the end of it is, but it was after dinner, and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there you go. Um, so we really define factorial in two steps. We write this down and call it fact prime, and then we apply y to that and call that fact. And um, now we use definition, definitional equivalence in a non-self-referential way, which is, yay, go us. And we get a factorial function. Is it, is it a, so so let's apply it to successor. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fair to say that if we did so, the answer would suck a whole lot. Yes. We <laughs> <laughs> in trouble. So I would have to do it all my <laughs> Churches, I, I, I think it's right. So church, remember, like you can write down non. You can, here's a language you can write down nonsense in it. I mean, you can write down nonsense in the English language. <coughs> you can also write down sensible things. Is, is it a coincidence that the Y kind of looks like a lambda stepping over a puddle? Um, <laughs> I think that's by design. Let's just uh, say. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. Let's go with it. Oh yeah. Uh, that's probably not correct. Uh, <laughs> So I, the, the reduction strategy I used here was copy paste. Yeah. Um, <laughs> of course, that means that any error from the previous slides has been replicated here. So I don't guarantee what will happen if you actually run this. Uh, in fact, I'm missing a lambda n at the very top somehow. So yeah, this is I screwed something up. But anyway, there should, should be a lambda n at the very top. You're missing a pretty printer first of all. <laughs> I'm, I'm, saying, I'm not missing a lambda n because that's the thing applied to the y combinator, which is there, and this is the y comp. This is whatever. Okay. I don't know. Um, Could you go back a slide? Yeah, you want to check this? <laughs> <laughs> this to this. Okay. Um, what was the, the, the look like? The back quote or something? Or the, That's a prime. That's a prime. I don't mean that to be a, a, a logical operation. I mean that just to be a notation yeah. thing. Fact prime, the prelude to fact. Oh. Fact is the sequel to fact prime. Mm -hmm. Fact prime gets really angry yeah. and reverses. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so we're out of the high-minded part of the talk, and actually we're almost done, for those of you who are bored. Um, not a moment too soon. So let's discuss some properties. I'm not going to prove these, but maybe BS about why they're true. Uh, the Church-Turing thesis. Uh, okay. It's not only, it's, by thesis they mean, well, there's a theorem here, but we're also going to make a statement. 
So Church and Turing, so Turing of course has Turing machines, which probably a lot of you have heard of, another formalization for computation. And in fact, given a Turing machine, you can represent it as a lambda, and given a lambda, you can represent it as a Turing machine. Okay, so you can do that. Um, and uh, so there's an equivalence between things you can write down in terms of Turing machines and things you can write down in terms of lambdas. Um, I, I'm sorry, yeah. but just, you know, a little weak in English. This means it can be any of them, or all of them. Yeah, that means, yeah, they can convert from one to the other freely. Okay. Is it post-dimensional? Huh? Is it post-dimensional? Probably. Yeah, email, email uh, post would exist a short term. Well, post church yeah. Turing corresponds to Turing. Oh, oh, wait. Well, post was basically doing right with, with grammars. Right. Yeah. Right. Grammars to make you feel like, yeah, grammar type. Of oh, I miss, I miss grammars. Why do I miss grammars? Yeah. See, I got recursion theory in, but I missed it. Oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. There's more general versions. Okay, but they're also they're not only saying that these things are equivalent, but then they go ahead and say that any any algorithm that performs a computation can be expressed in that, which is sort of a statement of well, because we haven't really defined algorithms yet, have we? So we're taking these formal systems and saying, well, that's what computation is. So it's not only a theorem, but it's a assertion. Okay. Well, I guess the bigger thing is that people try to define it. You know, came out all systems trying to find out and hey, what do you know? They all actually happen to be. Yeah, equivalent. I mean, there's some, so it sort of lends credibility to this, right? That you have all these different systems that were that came about to express mutual functions, and they turn out to actually be equivalent. So. I guess you can count that as evidence for the church Turing thesis. But again, the church Turing thesis is not a mathematical theorem. Oh, it's like a law of nature. You don't prove the laws of nature. <laughs> well, what is it? There could be other forms of conservation that haven't been discovered. There could be, yeah, other forms of conservation that haven't been discovered. I don't understand what laws of nature are. So, well, there's a hype of computation. People will argue that there are things more powerful than this. Yeah. Um, OK. So is everybody satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take the rest of the discussion before. Uh, Oh yeah, there does not exist an algorithm that decides whether or not two arbitrary lambda terms are equivalent, which implies by the church Turing thesis that there's no lambda term that decides whether two other lambda terms are equivalent through our BSM reductions. Um, can you repeat whole, the, this whole phrase with slower? Yes, sorry. Um, there does not exist an algorithm that decides whether or not two arbitrary lambda terms are equivalent. <laughs> Not, not one that works for all pairs, right? But huh? Not one that works for all of them. Not all possible. Right, right, yeah. This, there's not one universal algorithm that will right. take any arbitrary two lambda terms and say, oh, these are equivalent or they're not. Is this equivalent to the whole problem? Yeah, I think, right? But no. So I think, no, it's not equivalent. Sorry. Uh, dear God. It looks like it. it you can mis probably massage one of the <laughs> Whatever. Uh, uh, okay. I'm sorry. Who first stated that? This? Yeah. I don't know. You don't know. Sorry. Well, what? Oh, actually, so I think it was one of those. So you had right, the circle with Church and Pliny, and uh, who else was? Um, Pliny was a student of Church, right? But Church yeah, was also a student with it. Yeah. Worked with it. Yeah, directly. Church, Church, Church was a student of Church. Yes. Formally. For, okay, yes. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure of which of the. Yeah, but it's in the 30s, so you know, it's many times. Somebody there did that. Um, oh, I, I named this one, so now we have two names. Good. The church roster theorem. Uh, so, given terms T1 and T2 got from a common term T. Uh, I'm just going to give you the commutative, I mean the picture. Yeah, um, that's better. There you go, that's better. So if you have some, if you have some lambda term T that reduces to two lambda terms, you can always find um, a common reduction of both of those lambda terms. That immediately implies decidability. Only if every only if every lattice has a minimum, I guess. Right? No, every, whatever. I'm gonna fish you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I should have just I should have not done the high minded stuff right this. No, no, this is good. The right. right. other thing is good because <laughs> it's unexpected, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is called confluence, by the way. This is yeah. formal name. Yeah. We're also told you that we have an equivalence relation here yeah. by reduction. Yeah. Um, so we don't have normalization, but we have confluence. Well, but uh, this also shows that if a term is normalizable, then it's unique. Or if a term has some normalization, then they all converge. If, if there's a convergence, then there's one of two equivalents. Uh, but not everything converges. Um, okay, so. Now we're going to go, I'm not going to do this SKI calculus in depth, but I'm just going to define these commutators. Um, 
So these combinators are defined in terms of, so here's our friend, here's our friend truth, right? Here's the identity function. And uh, here's this weird thing, S, which we'll, we'll get into um, in a slide. And actually, if you, def if you take these combinators, if you take SK and I primitive, um, roughly speaking, with the notion of application, um, you have a logic that actually can import any lambda term into it. It turns out being equivalent logics. So it's called combinatory logic. It's made of combinators. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, I was okay. wondering why I and K suddenly are called combinators when they were something well, else. What well, were they? Well, the identity and... Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> good point. So I guess a combinator is we think like informally it's something that takes a function and gives you some, another function. Well, another way of looking at it is it's a lambda term that has all only bound variables. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's an excellent. Yes, a combinator well, definition. Good. Lambda term with only bound with the, where all variables are bound. Okay. You know, you can define them without the notion of variable at all. Yes, you can. Well, you can axiomatize. Yes, you can take these. You can take. You can axiomatize yeah. these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Never find them by by the the, the the laws of their. Precisely. You can do that. I'm not going to, but that's you can. That's what Schrodinger did. Exactly, Schrodinger. This is sort of that's what Schrodinger originally did. But yes, good. So connects this this talk somewhat. Is it's kind of okay. Yay. Um, oh yeah. There's why. <laughs> Obvious, right? <laughs> okay. Um, we can make combinators, but now there's this weird correlation between these combinators and interesting statements in the proposition of logic. Uh, so here's a statement: A implies that B implies A. Is an axiom of of um, propositional logic. Precisely. Which is exactly what this combinator is doing. Um, so look at that statement. Look at the K combinator. Then repeat this to yourself. <laughs> if I have a proof of A, if I give it a proof of B, I still have a proof of A. <laughs> Now this is we're getting sort of mystical chanting. Uh, yeah. um, this axiom. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. There should be another parentheses here. If a a implies b implies c implies that a implies b implies a implies c. Oh god. That one's good. Like that? Yeah. Oh good. Okay. So those intuitionists, that's good. I'm glad to make you that. Now you're going to show them the one that's bad. So we think about this S combinator. I, I'm, I'm sorry, the statement at the top, you say it's an axiom because so, somebody, somebody thought of combinatorial logic said this is one of the axioms. Well, well, well actually, those two axioms, I think, suffice with, with, with the law of modus ponens to generate all of what we call propositional logic. Uh, well, which propositional logic? The one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. Yes, that's a good question. The one that I'm talking about right now. <laughs> that's a good answer. May I? May I? Yes, go ahead. Oh, right. It does not suffice to give you the laws, the classical logic. There's one more, Pierce's axiom. But it does suffice for things like. Yes, you said this is all the axioms. Oh, yes. There may be, there may be one right. tiny little one. Right, right, yeah, you cannot, you cannot, you but cannot define, you cannot use the law of excluded nil from whatever. H O T T. This is close to the underlying propositional logic of H O T T. Yes. And I know your next slide, but I'll let you. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. sorry. So here's the S combinator. Um, with very hot stuff. I think it's hot stuff. This is hot stuff. This is hot stuff. If I have a way to get S. Oh, God. No, this is good. This is good. Go ahead. Read it. If I have a way to S of turning proofs of A into proofs that B implies C, right? Proofs of A to proofs of that B implies C. Mm -hmm. uh, then given, Jesus, all right. Then given a proof G that A implies B, I can make a proof that A implies C. That's what I've done here with the S combinator. It's as simple as repeated application, you see. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I paid him beforehand to interject. <laughs> Wait, you need one more axiom for, for the standard minimal intuition of logic. I'll tell you what it is. Okay. A implies A. Uh, but you can, That's all there is. Namely, okay. the identity function exists. Well, you can you define can I from S and K. Commonly, S K K is I, right? Yeah, I, don't, I, don't know. Know. I think I think these together with the rules of with the rule of modus ponens allow me to get A implies A. I didn't think. I didn't know that. All right. I will I'll add, I'll add, I'll add, I'm, I'm happy to add. But, but I, I do know that what I said is is, mm -hmm. is yeah. true if my memory holds, which <laughs> no longer it does. Uh, um, the only sane way to think about this stuff is category theory. Whoa! <laughs> Wait, I withdraw my statement. <laughs> I thought your next thing was, was going to be, so if you think that the arrow means 
there exists a function from the types. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to say that. Okay. Um, okay. That's what I'm sure you would say. This is like that object. Um, so I think uh, this course, this sort of corresponding to, um, say, A is the set of all. Okay, I guess I'm saying set, but that's okay. Right? So a, is, set five. a is the set of all proofs of proposition little a. B is the set of proofs of proposition little b. And what I've given you, um, well, uh, is an element of this state. Whatever an element means. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or I've given you something that inhabits this type. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so. Can you just say what the what looks like exponential notation is? Oh well, yeah. So in terms of sets, in terms of sets, I think of this as functions from b to a. Okay. This is functions from a to functions from b to a. Yeah. Okay. So in other words, it's the same like the other equation. It's the same idea. Only we might not work in the category of sets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yes, so that's um, the nice categories is like, in terms, including the category of sets, looks like it is equivalent to that. Ah, so. Um, that's actually Korean and Korean too, right? Um, and then, um, yes, so I love Korean. And um, the latter, okay, so the point is this thing contains the first projection by the universal property of products. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, and then we can map that over to, because that exists, we know that this, this is inhabited and therefore true. Um, from my perspective. Uh, so, right, that's what I just said. Um, again, this is breezy stuff, we're almost done. Um, it corresponds between lambda expressions. So I, I sort of given you, I've sort of waved my hands about this correspondence between lambda terms because I was using the common names, but they're in terms of lambdas. Uh, logical formulas from the propositional logic are, in general, you can, you can become more general than that uh, in certain circumstances. Um, and objects and categories. If you don't know what the word, hopefully some of you know what categories, but you know that's okay. This is called the Curry Howard Lambda correspondence. Okay, when I just sort of wave my hands around the Curry Howard Lambda correspondence in a couple instances. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thank you.